How's it going, everybody? This is Eric. And this is Justin. And we are the hosts for The Score. Score. Yeah, so we have a little bit of a delay. Usually that's on time whenever you've, if you've listened to our podcast before. <laughs> but we are excited and delighted to be able to be able to share with you today. Um, we wanted to have our cameras on, but we had a couple of technical difficulties. But, you know, you already know our voices if you've listened to our podcast. So we already know how to do this thing. Uh, yeah. So with that, with that being said, we want to introduce ourselves to you guys. And so, you know, who are we? We want to give you a more in-depth uh, look at who you're listening to and what we've done. So I am Eric Jimenez. I am the co-host of The Score. I am currently serving as an assistant director of bands at Prairie View A&M University, which is an HBCU just right outside of Houston, Texas. I am also a doctoral student in music education at the University of Houston. On top of that, I have about over 10 years uh, experience in revitalizing and enhancing band and music programs in the Houston Independent School District, which is a, a, one of a very large urban context. Context. On top of that, of being a public school teacher, I did a one-year stint of being an administrator. And so I, uh, admittedly, I uh, did not like it. And so I came back to the band hall after that. And uh, although people would tell me that, you know, I did well, but, you know, hey, it, it wasn't for me. Um, I'm a proud husband and a proud daddy of two, as you can see in my picture. And which would relate to what we're talking about today. I am actually a former DJ. I'm Justin McLean. I'm the uh, the other co-host of the the score. Uh, currently, right now, I'm the percussion director and assistant director of bands at High Tower High School and Lake Olympia Middle School, which is in Fort Bend ISD, located in Missouri City, a uh, little ways outside of uh, Houston, Texas. Uh, I'm in my master's program working on uh, Masters of Divinity at Reformed Theological Seminary. Uh, I have nine years, this will be my 10th year, this upcoming school year, be what it may be, uh, is going to be my 10th year uh, within the urban context, HISD, now in Fort Bend ISD. Uh, I too am a husband, a father of four, my, my last child, amen, my last child will be here <laughs> uh, at the end of August. And uh, my introduction to music comes, stems from me being an artist, a uh, musician in the church, as a worship leader, producer, and a minister. So, yeah. So some people know this, but some people don't. And a lot of it had to do with the fact that Justin and I felt that we were living a double life. Uh, it was pretty much our identity as an educator and music educator, and then our other identity and or other identities that Honestly, we had some issues or didn't feel the strength of how to bring that into our traditional way of doing music education. Uh, and 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 it kind of went into uh, how we operated. So we maintained those identities outside of our classroom. But yet again, we didn't know how to, to make that happen. Yeah, that double life. Uh, I used to always kind of joke about it in my first few years of teaching. I was like, by day, I'm a teacher. By night, I'm this budding artist. I'm in the, you know, in the studio late. I'm, I'm doing gigs throughout the city uh, and this, that and the other. And I thought um, just because of how music was introduced to me early on in you know middle school, uh, even different from my experience in church, I thought those were two different worlds. And I thought that I'm a musician, I play at church, I do, you know, produce the music, arrange the music for worship, I'm in the studio, I'm writing songs, and then I'm also this, you know, uh, uh, music educator. I teach all things music proper in regards to notes, rhythm, intonation, and all of that. And I never really thought to bring those worlds together until maybe halfway through or the start of my second year of teaching where I said, man, what I'm doing is relevant to my students in my classroom. And so I started to bring in, you know, different records I was producing or tracks that I was creating, songs that I had written, uh, uh, songs that I had produced, um, as well as what I was doing in my local church. I brought that into my classroom. And for me, in my context, in my classroom, for my students and my village of, 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 of young music musicians, uh, it really helped. It, it made the classroom more organic, more authentic, and it allowed my students to be who they naturally were uh, because they were responding to the way that I naturally was and that there was no difference. It was that I was melding these worlds together, the, the, the church and the, the, you know, the stage along with, uh, you know, music ed from the Western civilization uh, concept. So, yeah. 
And so the picture you see of me uh, was uh, back in the day, if you will, at uh, I think I was a sophomore in college at Prairie View. Uh, Justin was probably a freshman at the time. We're just a year apart. And yep. uh, and, and I started DJing at the age of 14. Uh, and, and admittedly, I started DJ, DJing for the intent to chop and screw music. Now, if you don't know about that, if you listen to our our episode, uh, screw music that was you know coined by DJ Screw here in the, in the, the city of Houston is pretty much a uh, slow down tempo, and then it has the the chop part would have a downbeat and an upbeat present within the same beat, and so that you'll have a you know track A and track B. All that to say, that was my intent of being a DJ. I was fortunate enough that my brother gifted me an entire DJ set at the age of 14, but his requirement was that I make it a business. And so I did. At the age of 14, I'm passing out cars. I created this this image, this identity of, uh, and, it, and it aligned more so towards a hip hop DJ. Uh, so through college, I was DJing at clubs. I was DJing. I had this also this professional DJ setup. I was doing weddings and quinceaneras and proms. Uh, so I was DJing, I'd say, uh, three out of the four weekends out of a month. It was a big part of who I was as my identity. But quite honestly, I felt this um, shame, this fear of not knowing how to tell my professors, who I re still revere to this day, that you know I do this type of art form, that I do this type of thing with music, because I, you know, we we were taught that the classical diaspora was was king, and I honestly didn't know how it could complement that. Now, you know. I can reflect back on those times because, I mean, when I was 14, 15, 16 year old Eric, I'm over here mimicking and mocking these DJs off the radio to try to pick up like a DJ voice. Uh, I also can mimic and mock kind of the uh, the Spanish locutores that sound like Count Dracula in Spanish. I have <laughs> I picked up some of those things. Part of that I can attribute to my art of code switching. But. When we got into the classroom, as the picture you can see on the right, that's our last assignment that Justin and I had the benefit and honor of serving together. Uh, I was serving as director of bands while Justin was serving as director of percussion and assistant director of bands. And that's where we were able to kind of, and, and as we have been since we've known each other, kind of motivate each other, egg each other on. I mean, I went yeah. to go check him out at South by Southwest when he performed. And likewise, he's always been there for me. So. We've been able to do that, but at the same time, now as educators, we reflect on those situations and those lived experiences. And if we get the opportunity, you know, this is kind of what we led to. So ultimately, if you can kind of hear the fact that, you know, I might have a voice for radio, or if you can hear some of the things that I say, it's because I genuinely picked that up from my experience and my time DJing. Yeah. And I think that story within itself kind of helps us go to this next step it's your brand right w whatever you're building wherever you're you are in your process of creating uh uh and going to go outside of your classroom you have to think about the brand all of us right now we thrive off of brands right whether it's our iphone whether it's the starbucks coffee uh whether it's the 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 certain cars we drive or clothes that we wear it's thriving off of the brand and that brand fleshes itself out in so many different ways so the question is what's the goal what's the goal of your brand and then that has to take us to well once i figure out that goal what will help me is what i'm bringing to the table and it's those unique traits right so it's your voice what 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 are you voicing what's unique about your message or what's unique about the the wealth that you could be as a resource to the people you're trying to reach in whatever capacity right and once you figure that out then you have to pour that into the context right so so for us me and eric our voice was teaching and speaking to the urban music ed environment the inner city the those that are can be forgotten about at times and we wanted to use our voice as a resource to those contexts now in our minds to you know begin we were like we're missing something the directors like you him and i uh, we felt that they were missing the information to be successful, to be encouraged, to be empowered. And so we felt like if we could build around what we bring to the table, not taking away from anybody else, not knocking anybody else down, but saying, hey, we have a specific message for a specific context. If we can bring this and, and put a, a spin on it and really focus it in, we could see some fruit of the labor. And so where it started, it started for us thinking just personal, right? Us sitting on our lunch break us sitting and saying you know what like how can we be of help to the other band director that's in college right now that looks like you and me that comes from a background like you and me um how can we provide them with 
the edu the educational aspect that they may miss out in those cl classes on the college level or that they're going to miss out on when they first start student teaching because they may not get that information right so it, it started on a personal level we want to reach other people like us well then we said well what does it look like to go out towards the school and then the school moves out to the organization as a whole whether that's middle school the high school organization the collegiate level and the professional world and and you have to be able to sit down and kind of even even if it's not super concrete just very uh, uh taint those ideas out there so you can start to formulate what's going to happen and realize that as you find out what's missing, right? And you bring that to the table and you figure out, okay, I wanna meet this person. I wanna reach this school. Maybe it's just your school or schools like yours that you'll be in, that you'll be teaching in. Then you have to say, there's plenty of space at the table for you. Your brand is uh, uh, able to compete with everybody else. It's not a, a, a monolithic thing. It's not a one size fits all. It's everybody has something different. And if you bring it to the table, there will be people that will show up, that will partake, that will support and encourage you to go even further. And you got to think, we just started this last year, right? Like, I know you're probably thinking this information sounds good, but I, I don't really think that this can happen for me. We yeah, thought the same right. thing. We literally sat in our office at the last school that we worked at together and service together. And we were just talking we were like, man, we should come up with something that we can give and, and really get these thoughts out into the atmosphere, into the into the world so people can hear it. And lo and behold, we just started, man. And you can do it, too. Like you can come up. Your brand is already there. It may take some time or it may take some some uh, some moments for you to sit there and say, OK, what needs to be here? How do I say this? What's my context? And I think if you are honest and 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 just believing in yourself and just to take it by storm, it can happen. But you gotta think about that brand and know that your brand is missing and that it can have space in this in this content-based area. So that leads us to you identifying what's gonna be your audience, who's gonna be your audience, who's gonna be absorbing in the, this information and how uh, in regards to your content delivery. I can tell you that Within the system that we've created in music education, we at times depend on the the person who has earned their stripes, like uh, and rightfully so. Like if we're going to a professional development to learn how to do something, you want to know that that person did it and has success doing that. That's where some of the the imposter syndrome came in for for Justin and I, and not knowing will people value our voice, will people uh, understand where we're coming from, will we be able to help, and that 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 mentality can creep up on you and not allow you to really share and, and do it organically in the way that we were able to do that. So our audience was that because we were influenced by several factors, but one of one was attending conferences consistently. And Justin and I have always been attentional about going to uh, clinics that were specifically you know, catered to our, our, our context. And that being of an urban school teaching environment, Title I, under-resourced, et cetera, all those things that were applicable to us, even though we would attend some of the, the you know, the more affluent programs, we were optimists and trying to say, okay, how can that apply to my setting? But then in return, when we were going to the ones that were catered to us, we noticed that there was this ongoing uh, message, if you will, of pretty much people complaining and telling others to, to find another job. And so yeah. we wanted to find an audience that was willing to absorb solution-based strategies that could help in the classroom. So for us, we started thinking about, okay, that talks to the person who's in the schools right now, who's working and putting in the work, but you know, they're coming to us, like they ask questions like, how do I do X, Y, and Z? But then I I don't know how to reach my students. How do I I'm limited on instruments? How do I increase instrument inventory, et cetera? So then that was our main target. It was like, let's go get some teachers, let's talk about things, and let's let's get let's get in their ears. What we were fortunate enough to do though is now be able to target in service undergraduate students. And so yeah. Uh, the, you know, we're, we are thrilled. I mean, we get students hitting us up talking about they're having discussions about our episodes uh, within themselves and their own NAFME chapters and their own student and future music educator chapters. This is exactly uh, what we allowed to happen. But quite honestly, we didn't target those people. Uh, and we're just so benefit. We, we're grateful and, and beneficial to that happening from this platform being created. And so you know, this is speaking to what we did, but admittedly, like, are you trying to build 
uh, a business outside of your classroom, you know, and rightfully so, because uh, we all know we could use some extra bread and money if we're educators. And so if you're looking to build an online, you know, business through this, through this option of doing that. So this could serve as recruitment twofold. For example, Justin and I use social media and using our brand of our classrooms. We actually would brand every single one of our bands. Hence why you saw that t-shirt at the last assignment we worked at at Heights High School. It was something about that, my experience of getting, I'm, I'm gonna just be real, some cheesy shirts that I used to wear back in high school that I would take off after a pep rally because I just didn't want to be seen in them. That when I became an educator, I said, man, I, I'm gonna get my students really cool shirts uh, because on top of that, they would go and brand my organization, brand my music program within the halls, within the community. And then on top of that, we would use that brand into social media. Are honestly, if you're representing and extending your brand outside of the classroom, even if specific for your classroom, it might be in recruitment. It might be able to reach students through social media that you didn't get a chance to speak to at the recruitment fair or at orientation and what have you. We've had quite a bit of success. Then on top of that, you could be seeking potential clients. So this could be, how do I get more clients? And so Justin and I have been guests on a couple of podcasts recently, uh, and we are more than happy to return the favor when we have guests as well. And so with yeah. that being said, this allows for even more listeners because they have a following and we have a following. And then indirectly, now they've become listeners as well of our podcast. So ultimately now, what we've kind of, catered our podcast is for all stakeholders. Parents are involved yeah. in our podcast too. They're listening. We have former band parents. They're consistent listeners. But ultimately, this has become a, a podcast for all. Uh, we have music uh, education practitioners, researchers, uh, higher ed to the, to the elementary level, uh, community, and et cetera. We've been able to create this conversation that allows for everybody to be involved and included in this. So what I want you to think about while you're doing this is to really reflect, OK, who do I want to talk to? Who do I want to reach? But at the same time, I don't want you to set limits that will prohibit you from things that have happened for us, like serving undergraduate students. Uh, yeah. One of our colleagues uses our episodes to even play to his students at the, at the high school level to present sometimes a representation model that might not be accessible in person. Uh, we use video. Why couldn't it be to hear, like, for example, my colleague, uh, the associate director of bands at Prairie View, Brandon Hopkins, when we interviewed him and students hear his story and, and hear themselves and, and what they and what they hear from him. So your voice and identity, I think we got to pause right here because I want everybody that's attending this right now to to really take hold of this and understand that what you're building and what you're trying to go beyond your classroom with uh, involves you, the person, right? It is not that you are creating something totally different. No, what you're doing is creating or using a platform so that your voice can go further. Hence, your voice, your identity. I think one of the things that me and Eric really do well, um, and I think it's just who we are, uh, if you've listened to any of our episodes, I'm the I'm the you know the 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 comedian of the of the group if you will right I'm I'm very joking um, I'm trying to create who I am in the classroom who I've been for you know hundreds of students over the course of my career right there in where we record I don't want to be anybody different Eric is the he's the the very fatherly stoic you know type person um, and and he's that on the podcast every episode are there moments where we switch and i become something else and he becomes something else by all means yes but who we are is who you'll see if you meet us you know on the street or at a convention or anything like that mm -hmm. and so in building this what we want you to know is that the delivery of your con content i want to encourage you to use your voice and i know you're thinking why does he keep saying that because what you say how you say it and who you're saying it to matters right i am an african-american male uh you know eric is a uh, latino male and so we are speaking how we are right and and of course we want to use proper language and we want to do all of those things but on on your content for your thing you don't have to code switch Right. You can be who you are. You can use your voice to be effective in bringing the message that you're trying to bring. I always try to remind people that we have certain people that are going to hear from us only. Right. And I don't say that to be you know, to be a bad thing. I'm saying that 
as we open up people's ears to other voices and other people, they'll be more receptive from somebody like you or the person that you may be doing this with. So I want to encourage you to use your voice, be proud of it, be confident in it, and, and make that a part of what they get when they tap into your content. So when we get to that, you know, I um, I know and and I've been present to the fact that I know how to code switch. Um, I can probably credit that to DJing as well and mimicking voices and and doing that. But it wasn't really uh, brought to my forefront and, and made it very clear until I was in graduate school where some of my colleagues openly told me that they don't have to code switch. And I was dumbfounded by that, just kind of like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I, I literally code switch almost every day in every situation and every type of thing. So back in the day when, when this was kind of still uh, just a uh, an idea, uh, and when we were working together, I was about to take a trip down to San Luis Potosi, Mexico, where my, my in-laws live. And, and we want to make sure that our children still have that connection and be able to visit. So we set up these biannual trips down there. Uh, that year we were choosing to drive. So it's going to be a quite of a lengthy drive at that time. I'm going to be real. I was not listening to the podcast. The only time that I would listen to podcasts was to catch up on my, uh, my, my sermon that I might've missed on, on Sunday. Uh, <laughs> no so, judgments, brother, no judgments. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. But I, uh, you know, Justin was always that person. I mean, since from the, from his first year teaching, working with me, uh, to our last teaching assignment, I would always tap onto him like, hey, who are you listening to? Recommend me some artists. Uh, at that time, I was like, hey, I'm about to take a long drive. I don't know what the service is going to be like. Put me on game to some podcasts. They, and, he, and he gave me several. And so one of them was called Pat and it's called Pass the Mic. And it's and it's hosted by Jamar Tisby and Tyler Burns. If you haven't checked them out, it this is a podcast of two scholars, two black men scholars that talk about the Christian perspective through the black lens. Now. When we were, when I was listening to one of the episodes, my wife had fallen asleep. Uh, I think I was an hour 20 of driving uh, and she wakes up and right in the middle of their conversation, they were talking about how iconic and representative the black barbership barbershop is in black communities. And she, she kind of woke up and she was like, what, what, what are you what are you listening to? And I was like, <laughs> hey, it's a cool podcast, you know. Now, what I gathered from that, I mean, I, I resonated with that message so much because I'm hearing that I'm like, OK, they got the credentials, their degree, you know, they're they uh, they they're doing the work. They're in service. But what really, really caught my attention was the way they were talking to each other. And it reflected similarly to the way Justin and I would talk in our office. It, you know, it, and it's an ongoing joke when he would walk in with some new kicks and I was like, oh, you just. He's just going to flex on us like that. OK. All right. You know, and so we would use bro and, you know, but you catch me in front of my my teachers uh, given a, a parent conference, you know, or then I'm code switching. I'm using a different vernacular. I'm yeah. using a different delivery method. And it gave me this empowerment uh, to know that it's OK uh, to speak the way you speak. And just recently, my wife has really acknowledged that she's like, you know what? I, I'm really proud of you. I can tell that you you've gotten a lot more comfortable with presenting of who you truly are. And so that mm. goes into doubling back into with encouragement, use your voice. So Pastor Mike was definitely somebody uh, and something in a podcast model that inspired us and continues to inspire us to this day. Now, in your content delivery, the great thing about where we are in society is we all know, right, um, that content comes through different streams, whether it's podcasts, blogs, YouTube, Instagram, whatever the case may be, Facebook lives, all of those types of things, right? And so in building beyond your classroom, always know that there are many means to get where you're trying to go, right? That you could couple a podcast with a blog, you could do YouTube with podcasts, you could do Instagram with blogs, whatever the case may be, understand uh, that you have the opportunity to get your content out there and to be just as creative, right? There's always, I always consider social media like music. There's always something new coming, right? There's a new sound, there's, uh, uh, there's a new style, a new whatever the case may be. And so be up on how to reach your content or how to reach your context with your content. It may be podcast. For me and Eric, that's just where we are in our lives. That's just what we were doing. And so we figured, hey, there are other people that are like us that uh, have families that are 
popping things on while they're on their road at work and this, that, and the third. But you may be in a different environment, a different place um, where you are, and the blogging may work. The Instagram live videos may work. Uh, Instagram TV, YouTube uh, uh, shows along with your podcast. So I would encourage you to experiment and figure out what works best for you from the tech tech age or tech spot like what what can you do well without having too much issues but also what can you do and what can you use that gets your content out there that people are engaged with it they're running across it and they can see it um and it's it's readily and accessible and for them now to that to that notion i want to also add that whatever you choose to do make sure that you remain consistent with it so yeah. don't jump on one time to youtube and do a live session there and then the next time you jump on Facebook and do it there when people might have gone to YouTube to look for you, you want to remain consistent. On top of that, you can tell that our format, those of you that have listened to us on more than one occasion, you can tell that our format pretty much stays the same. We have a first section, we have in rotation, a second section, and then we end it with some takeaways. People expect that. On top of that, we people expect consistency in delivery. So if you are committing to every week, make sure that you set up structures to every week. Right now, we're in the summer and we've given us some time so we're making some really huge life changes, both Justin and I, that we've given us our bi-weekly episodes now, but we've been yep. consistent with that. So whatever you choose to do, make sure that it is consistent. Make sure that you choose to do it all the time. For example, you could couple it like the way we do. We release our podcast, but we don't have a YouTube channel. We, we know we chose not to do that, but we yeah. are sticking with the podcast, but we have a Facebook, Twitter, and an Instagram that all reflects the same information that's shared on all three platforms. So whenever I share those things and Justin shares those things, you can tell we have an image, we have an identity, even visually on yeah. top of the aesthetic of the voice that we provide. We provide a certain logo, there's a color and an image. So for example, that, that right there is when we started off, we started off obviously kind of a, a very organic grassroots approach. We're doing it ourselves. Let's put things out. Let's pay for things. And then we were able to develop a logo. So whatever you choose to do, I would encourage you to have some type of logo, some type of color scheme, some type of image that relates to who you are and be consistent with those. Uh, the, you know, I sat in a, a CBDNA, the College Band Directors National Association Clinic of the University of Michigan. Uh, band program only uses a certain font and certain colors, and it has to be only that, and that's their marketing strategy. And we're, and so if you look at our, 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 our Instagram, our Twitter, our Facebook, you can see some of those same kind of aspects and features being reflected in the way even we deliver the aesthetics and the visual representation of content episodes, of, of our logo, of of different things. And so we would definitely encourage you to do that. This isn't difficult to do. This is something that you could create on a word processing document. This could be on a PowerPoint. This could be using, um, you know, obviously, some more advanced techniques that we'll show throughout the, the, the rest of the webinar. But just think, OK, I want this to happen, and I'm going to stick to it, and I'm going to go from there. The minute you start changing it consistently, then it's not going to be as consistent. So we would encourage you to use the same logo, the same colors, and the yep. same image throughout your, 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 your content delivery. Yeah, and and like you said, just to build on that consistent aspect, what people miss when we say be consistent and don't jump around, I think there's two perspectives to that. One is how do you prepare to put your product together? That you have to be consistent in. What do I mean by that? Me and Eric are communicating throughout the week about upcoming topics and show ideas, right? And we'll brainstorm apart. We'll come together at the end of the week. Uh, and since we have kind of hit this coronavirus, we have been recording at his home and I'm at my home, and we, you know, through media, we're able to get that done. But we've already discussed, hey, we want to talk about this. Hey, you think on this, I'll think on that. A few minutes before we record, we kind of abreast each other of each other's ideas and we go into it. We are consistent with that. So that way, when we get to the recording moment, when we get to the cultivating of of the content, we're not stuck and, and we're not chasing, you know, rabbits down a rabbit hole, right? Like if we're not prepared, then we'll just get on the phone and say, or we'll get on the call and we'll be like, well, let's just talk about this. Well, then that takes away from the very product that we've been putting together. So um, you need to be consistent in how you prepare, which ultimately helps you not jump around and be consistent in what you're giving, right? So we are 
urban music educator apologists, if you will, right? We are defending why we should be in the world we're in, why you should want to be in it. Here's the things you should be looking for and how to approach your students and all of these different things. You're never going to log on or catch an episode and we're talking about, you know, remodeling a house, right? Or HGTV <laughs> or anything like that. As much as we love those things, that's not a part of our product. So we have to do the hard work. And this is what separates quality from things that may get, you know, referenced or may get listened to every so often. It's the level of consistency that when I log, when I clock in, I'm getting this product, I'm getting this content and it's good every time. And I think if you are doing the hard work of preparing, doing the hard work of releasing, if you release every Wednesday at this time, you release every Wednesday at that time, you will see the fruit of your labor. Um, but sometimes we get we we chase that rabbit because we're looking for the most radical thing to do to create traction when in actuality um, what we've been able to accomplish is just because we've been consistent. It, it's no we didn't do anything crazy. You know, we don't have anything else going on. We just drop when we drop. We do this. We make sure to do this. And that's what helps us. So please be consistent and do the hard work. So to add on to that. You know, if, if you're into leadership books, uh, as I as I am, I have seen this word consistently <laughs> is to be consistent is is whatever you choose to do. Uh, for example, uh, the book, The One Thing, choose one thing and do one thing very well. Um, yeah. I was introduced on, uh, at, you know, back in high school, I was already self-proclaimed that I didn't I didn't like to read. Uh, but it was on one day that I was speaking to my father and he was like, you know what, here's a book. What I want you to do is read 10 pages per day. If you can read more, you know, I don't just do 10 pages. And that year I put that into practice. Within that one year, I read 14 books and I, that's the most I've ever read within, within a year. And it, and it gave me this model and an example of whatever you choose to do, just be consistent at it, you know, because for example, we all know how, um, what the, the recipe is, if you will, to, to be healthy and that's to eat well and to exercise. But yet we still find excuses to not do that. So with this, I would encourage you to structure your schedule to make sure that things don't interfere as Justin said. And if they do have a contingency plan, so you can still follow that. And in the event that you do have an emergency, be real, be honest and say, Hey, things came up, you know, we're going to have a delayed episode by next week because things do happen. And so I also want to encourage you to humanize yourself in this, in this ability to, to be able to connect with whoever is going to be your audience. And so this, this has allowed us to reflect on how we do this. So all these things have inspired even the way we, uh, but, you know, potential guests now and, and how we structure those, those meetings. But from there, it has allowed us the space and the creativity to say, you know what, hey, we did it this way. Let's branch off and, and, and include this. So the content delivery is important. I want you to think of, of strategic ways. And on top of that, on ways people receive information, like Justin said, is it through a phone? Is it through a computer? Is it through uh, whatever aspect of technology that they might be using? We have to be more aware of some of those things to allow us to get to that point. So resources, you know, one of those things that we, we get we get asked from time to time, you know, what are y'all doing? What are y'all using? What's the equipment that you're putting on? What mics are y'all using? Uh, all that to say, let me let me make sure that y'all understand that this, I want to front load that podcasting itself uh, does not have to be expensive. Um, you know, the, the more, uh, I guess, higher quality that you might want to present, especially if it's in a video format then it's definitely gonna require some more gear, some more technologies and different cameras and that sort. But we did a lot of research beforehand. I'm just watching YouTube videos and seeing recommendations and reviews and different things of that nature. And so I would recommend you do the same. If you have an idea saying, I wanna do a YouTube video, go and research that. We do the same model within music education. We go find out who's the best, who's the best at what they do, Let's go either go visit their classroom. Let's go sit down with them and have a cup of coffee. Let's go pick their brain or let's go watch them present at a conference uh, and then figure out what they're doing and then see how if that works in our context, in my model and what I'm trying to do. And so we Justin and I continue to do that in education. Uh, we did that while we were serving in public school. We would find out, OK, so and so made first an area marching contest. Let's see if we can go visit. Let's go be a fly on the wall. Let's see if we can pick some things up and then make it applicable to your setting. So with that being said, what we started doing is before we even launched 
anything that we had, uh, we were throwing out ideas. We had like a sit down session, a brainstorm session, and we just brain dumped potential names and different things. And then we settled on the score. And so we were excited about having that. But then the next step was, all right, are the handles available? You know, and not only Twitter, but does Twitter, Instagram and Facebook all have these available? Because what that will allow you to do is you don't have to. So if you type in at pod the score on Twitter, it's going to pop up on Instagram. And if you put facebook.com backslash pod the score, it's going to pop up there as well. And so we wanted to keep it consistent. That would allow even for the marketing aspect for just to put that one handle. Some people make the mistake. They, they launch their stuff and then they fail to realize that the handle's already taken somewhere else. So do your research ahead of time. We were lucky enough to, to land pod the score and we were able to claim it on, on all social media at, uh, sites. On top of that, go to a, a URL hosting site and type it in. See if that URL is available because you might potentially want to create a website dedicated for your content, for your brand, for your whatever idea you have. Additionally, you want to cross check into the business names. You want to start looking at do people already operate as this? You know, there's a just there's a restaurant here in Houston that I frequent and I stop by and I see a name change, but everything's still the same. When I asked them, they're like, a business from LA found out about us and they sued us. So we just went ahead and changed the name. You just want to avoid any type of situation like that. So there are some business aspects that uh, are required for you to launch this, but it's okay. You know what I mean? And unfortunately, some of us didn't have this training as in teacher education or music teacher education, uh, but that's okay. This is where Justin and I got some of this training from me being a DJ, him doing his work as an artist. So it allowed us to complement what we're doing here. So when we got kicked off, we use canva.com. We still use it to this day. That's what we use to drop our episode uh, artwork, uh, to do any type of graphic that we share on social media. We use that, we use the free version, even though there's a paid version, which you know, by all means, go for it, but we use the free version. On top of that, we use a graphic designer. Three Monster Effects, my buddy uh, Victor here in Houston has always done my t-shirt designs and my logo designs for my schools and my band programs. So we tapped him on his shoulder, he helped us out, we were able to create the new logo that you see um, now as presented for the score and on the bottom of your screen. So we really wanna recommend that. We use buzzsprout.com as our podcast host. Uh, we pay a monthly service. What we do is upload the episode there and it disseminates it to all podcasting platforms that they have an association with, which uh, from my understanding is pretty much all of them. And additionally, on top of that, you, you if you could see the mic that I'm using, it's a, it's a really nice mic now, uh, but we actually kicked off using the Audio-Technica ATR2100 USB mic. Uh, the Blue Yeti. And by the way, we were buying this, you know, this USB mic before we went into this uh, teaching, virtual teaching model. So I do know, I uh, think some, some are on back order, but, you know, they're a lot more popular now, given that a lot of people are having to work from home. But if you go and check out some of those reviews, people cannot tell the difference from a con uh, an expensive condenser mic versus that that uh, USB mic. The only downside I can tell you guys from that, and it's really not much of an issue, is you have to just be in close proximity to speaking into the microphone uh, to eliminate any uh, outside noises. Understanding social media, it, it's all different across the different mediums, right? Um, what I would say and what me and Eric did, we did some time researching what works for Instagram or works for Facebook. I mean, down to the T of at what times are most people going to be on to view your uh, their their uh, their page or their Twitter page or whatever. Uh, what are the best days? One of the most active times. And so I think if you do that legwork before, it also helps release some of the anxiety and anxiousness that you get when you put a post out to tell people about your upcoming episode of content right and it keeps you from doing the same thing over and over again right you're posting on this day and then posting at this time or you're posting at really odd times where people aren't really engaging i think that that helps a lot to understand the nuances that come with facebook that understand the nuances that come with twitter understand the nuances that come with instagram knowing that will help your product uh have a little bit more movement to it right it, it, it's great to have great content but you also want to make sure you're being proactive and intentional about how you're using social media. The other thing I would say is you need to use social media. You need to be very active 
uh, in creating a page, uh, creating a site just for your content and your brand, right? You may have your own individual. Me and Eric both have our own individual Instagrams and Facebooks, but we also have a Facebook, uh, The Score. We also have Pod The Score on Instagram, uh, on Twitter. And so what it does, it provides life for you that you're able to operate in that as well as your own page and people can connect to that page um, uh, while they're wanting to get in contact with you, right? And that's gonna happen. One of the things that has happened over the course of us launching and, and doing this is that we've come in contact with so many people because of the interaction uh, with the audience. And so I would tell you, one of the best things that helps our brand and really helped us grow and really get to where we are now is that we interacted with people. If somebody messaged me or messaged Eric or they messaged the score, um, we got back to them. We replied back, whether it was them tagging us and saying, we really enjoyed this or tagging my name or tagging Eric's name. Hey, I'm sending you a direct message. We really appreciate the support. Keep, keep listening. Hopefully we can connect, whatever the case may be. And what that does is it, it, it empowers you on this chain of people, right? So uh, this one person connected with me uh, via Instagram or connected with Eric and Eric responded and we both responded. Uh, then they tell the next person about what we're doing and the next person and so on. And so it kind of becomes this word of mouth echo chamber kind of grassroots thing that I think because of social media, we get confused that that doesn't still happen today when in actuality it really does and we can mm -hmm. speak to that kind of grassroots movement that took place because we weren't like we said earlier we were interested in texas man just to be perfectly honest and transparent we were just trying to reach people in our and where we are uh but here we are uh giving a webinar because we interacted with people that want to listen to the content and because of social media because of the way media is set up you can actually have that hand-to-hand -hand contact face-to-face -face thing without being face-to-face -face, right so i would i would tell you that level of integrity respect and and just honor that people give to you um that they don't owe you just because you have content it's shown with how you interact it's shown with how you understand the social media that you're using that people want to hear you they want to know you um and obviously you need to put up parameters like you know let's be safe and things like that uh, but don't let that stop you from interacting with people that can present other opportunities, can grow your platform to reach other people that need to hear what you're bringing to the table. And to add on to that, I, I have to acknowledge the, the power of social media yeah, and, and using it's it's been it's been outstanding. Uh, I, I am still humbled and, and grateful at the opportunities that Justin and I are getting to be able to share our message and connect and honestly connect with more people. As Justin said, if if you were the, you know, sitting at a bus stop waiting for the bus with me and we didn't know each other, we're going to get to know each other. I'm going to ask you, like, hey, how's it going? Uh, we're going to spark up a conversation. That's just who and who Justin and I are. Uh, and, and we're extreme extroverts when it comes to that. Um, <laughs> and so all that to be said, allowing this 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 platform these 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 apps to connect us with people that otherwise you know might have happened at a conference and and might have you know what i mean like we're not even sure but now this connectivity to say hey i'm i really like what you're doing uh let me know if you have a chance to sit down and chat uh just received an email yesterday from a gentleman who saw one of my presentations at TMEA and he and he thanked me for the podcast that I was doing and at the presentation I didn't mention the podcast I actually failed to mention it and and so from there he was able to you know uh, within my social media presentation to see hey he he also podcast as well let me listen to it now we plan on sitting down one day and uh and and talking shop if you will uh to do that and so once this thing's boys over but it's just been amazing i just got off of a guest lecture with the boston conservatory conservatory at, in berkeley because of social media the the professor yep. came across our stuff on instagram reached out to us we had a phone call and we said hey come you know come and hang out with my students and I'll be glad to, to be a, a guest on your podcast. This is the type of stuff that we love that's happening. And it, honestly, it happened organically. Uh, yeah. it, those of you that are in music teacher groups, Justin and I do not post our stuff in there. We, you know, we allow others to, uh, that's something that we just kind of, we, we dedicated ourselves and said, we're not going to go and drop our stuff in these music yeah. teacher groups. Let's just let it happen organically and let's see what comes yep. from it. And luckily, about six days ago, uh, we dropped a, a graphic on our social media websites and, and asked just what city and state are you listening from? And I'm talking about we were we were taking it back. All over the uh, place, man. 
I mean, we got South Korea, Indianapolis, yeah. all over Texas, New York, California, Florida. I mean, it was just uh, humbling. We are yeah. grateful that the fact that people are listening, uh, the thing that you can do for us is just share, share an episode, tag, tag a friend that might be, you know, uh, I know uh, higher education uh, professors are using our, our, our podcast as episodes, as a resource now. And so, you know, whatever it can be, this is creative scholarship, but that's the way you can help us. We're, we, if you can tell from our tone, if our, our message, we are here to serve you, we are here to serve yeah. others. And if our practice in, in school or our, has worked for you, then by all means, share it with somebody else, just like pay it forward. And this is what we're here to do. So last but not least, uh, this is going to be our last slide. We want to keep it up. And what we want to do is is offer any insight, drop some questions. This will be an opportunity for us to 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 go back and forth on on some things that we might be able to go uh, that we might have not mentioned in the in the webinar. If you have any questions, feel free to drop them and Justin and I can can answer them. Justin and Eric, thank you so much um, from the CMA Foundation. We are so appreciative of both of you. Um, I'm just going to sit here for a minute and see if we get any questions um, from our attendees, and then we'll just get them read out loud to y'all. All righty. Okay. Um, we have a question. How do you juggle the podcast and teaching full time? <laughs> let, let me add on to that teaching and I'm getting my doctorate. Yeah. You know? right, <laughs> like, right, and then, right. and then Justin in graduate school too. And let me add on to that too. Um, Justin just uh, bought a house. I am selling my house <laughs> next Friday. Uh, so we have so much that honestly, sometimes we don't share on the podcast. Um, yeah. So l l the biggest thing about that, and I, we have, I think Justin will agree with me on this one. Our wives, our family, oh, uh, yeah. are in oh, yeah. are in support oh, yeah. of what we're doing. And and yeah. for example, uh, earlier today, my two year old son is uh, very animated and a very great reflection of me as a child. Uh, but I can't present with him in the in the house, uh, to be honest. <laughs> Otherwise, he'd be knocking at my door and you'd hear his screams. Uh, so I love him, but I'm present to that. So what we do is block time. We set things on the schedule. Yeah. We put things in the calendar. We make our spouses aware and say, you know, hey, I need your support here. Uh, and that so I can tell you that's been that's been a, a challenge, but we block time consistently. So, for yeah. example, Sunday nights are my post-production um, nights, whether that means making a graphic on Canva or mixing down the episode, uh, Justin writing some things down in the notes section to share on social media. We block time consistently to do that. In the event that we don't, we do a contingency plan. We we, we reconvene right. and saying, hey, can you meet at this time? So I think the biggest thing, uh, the other day I was listening to a financial planner, a financial guru, Ramit Sadie, and he was advocating for the fact with Tim, uh, Tim Ferriss, that if it's not in the calendar, it's not going to happen. And so yeah. what we choose to do is to put it in the calendar. And from yep. there, if we, it's easier to say we, we didn't have time to do that versus not doing it at all and trying to put it in the calendar. You got anything for that, Justin? Yeah, I would say you got to start uh, the way you want to finish. Like me and Eric started recording, you know, on Sunday nights, cause we felt like that was just the best time. Like throughout the week with my kids, his kids, our wives, our, you know, parental duties and work duties, it just wouldn't have been smart for us to try to do that. And so Sunday is our, is our time. Um, and we always try to, especially in doing podcasts, we try to record either more than one episode or if we're not able to record more than one we've already prepped the idea for next sunday right so we don't leave the recording moment or the atmosphere until we figured out where we're going next sunday so that way throughout the week we can be prepared um and so yeah i would say start create the schedule that's going to work for you whether um you get a new job or as your brand starts to expand even more don't don't just kind of do it willy-nilly because that's the we didn't know things would take off like this if we if we didn't know that and we were just kind of going for what we knew i don't think we would be as successful uh as we are right now so i would say start with a process of where you're based on in your life your 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 way of life right now and shameless plug, uh, if you're thinking, well, I don't have time outside of teaching, go back to listen to our work-life balance episode uh, and yeah. try to work more efficient and effective yes. 
right. while you're, you know, dedicating your time and energy to the to your classroom and your school to allow things to happen for yourself that you might have an interest in as well. Great. Thanks, guys. Um, the next question is, how should we advocate for music education in this new era? Mm. Oh, that's oh a, uh, man, that's be for a couple of more hours. Yeah. Right. right. Uh, just, uh, okay. Well, I'm gonna go with this one. Um, be open to provide, because uh, there's so much that we could do, but be open to provide a culturally relevant and sustaining classroom. Um, 30, I said this earlier in my presentation, but 30 to 50% of our behaviors stem from our DNA, while 50 to 70% stem from our environment. What we have control is what the environment that we provide our students in our classroom. That's something yeah. that I really wanna advocate for you to understand, that you have that immediate control. If you're thinking, I can't change the world, I can't do it all by myself, you directly have control over your music classroom and that's the immediate impact that you have. And so I would advocate to say, how can I be more culturally relevant and sustaining of my child's cultures and, and those of others as well? And if your culture represents something different than the demographic that you're serving, then be open to share that as well as I've been doing throughout my career and being very proud to, to be a Mexican American man and allow my students to see that, that joy that I have for my heritage. Yeah, I would, I would, I would piggyback on that and say advocating for it is also knowing uh, like what do you bring into the table that would make someone want to get behind you, right? I think sometimes we kind of want to push models on kids, on communities where, I mean, you could do that, but you'd be advocating, you know, in the dark because nobody's going to want to get behind that. So you have to do the hard work of not only what Eric said, but researching and figuring out what you know, gives to those kids, what gives those life's kids, what gives those kids life. Uh, but I would also say building relationships where wherever you're teaching, right, with the the local, you know, instrument shop, with the with the music print shop, with different entities around where you are, um, so that th they can see, oh, there's something product based here. There's something that is helping and thriving with these kids. We want to figure out, We, me and Eric could talk about how many times people have just been like, hey, how can we help? And it, it wasn't because we went necessarily seeking for it per se, but we just, we got down and we got busy with just doing the work and creating an environment where kids wanted to be, parents wanted their kids to be. And then those same parents went to their communities, those same parents mm -hmm. talked to their admin team. And I, I, I always say this to, to teachers and educators, before you go knock on doors, you got to knock down the walls with your kids because those people will do the work for you. Like our job mm -hmm. is to educate is to educate the kids. Right. And don't get me wrong. Did me and Eric go out and say, hey, we need some instruments. Hey, can we get some funding? Yes, we did that. But when we made the kids really push the DNA and the, and the formality of what we were trying to do, man, we had parents doing that for us. We had parents, you know, making meals and doing di dinners to sell to make money and things like that. So I would say, man, do the work that that's probably a little bit more uncomfortable, which will get other people in your back pocket to help you do the stuff that you really don't care about. Like, we don't really care about fundraising. We just want to make music, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Great. Um, the next question is, what do you Google search to learn about social media trends? Um, I honestly just <laughs> put in random words. <laughs> uh, <laughs> like, what I, what I think I did was, uh, uh, you know, best time to, to post on Instagram, uh, yeah. best day, best, um, you know, uh, I did the same thing for releasing podcast episodes. Um, and so I, you know, when we were still commuting, a lot of our uh, colleagues were using our podcast as, as, you know, music for, or entertainment for their commute. And so 5 a.m. on a Monday to start off their week was a good, good time to do that. So, you know, be, be creative and just be, you know, I would also identify like Facebook, uh, posting trends. And then I, I did that and I got with Justin. I was like, Hey bro, like we got to drop on this day. We got to post on this day. Uh, right. so that, that's kind of what we did. And it was a very informal practice of just Googling. Yeah. Same. Okay. Um, what has been your greatest learning as you launched the podcast? Uh, mm, greatest learning. I think for me that, that people really want to know, um, I right. think sometimes like that was the biggest thing for me. And I tell Eric this all the time, like, you know, um, we got reached out by CMA, all these different entities. 
And I always pose this question, and it's just me being funny. I'm like, who are we? You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> who are we? Like, we're literally just guys that, you know, just worked hard, just tried to figure it out, tried to make the most of all our resources. Um, and I didn't, it was from a genuine place. And I don't even say this to be very like, oh, he's so humble. No, I'm really just saying like, we are people that we knew we had a sphere of influence amongst our peers of people that kind of came from the different, you know, situations that we come from. Um, but the fact that people are really wanting to know and they want to learn and they want to listen to voices that may not have been heralded uh, the years before. Um, so it was it was it was a big um, it impacted me in a way that said this is why we teach the very things we teach our kids. I'm experiencing, you know, as a 31, 32 year old you know, podcaster um, that that people are willing to know people are willing to learn if you have the courage and the faith to just kind of go and do it. Um, and that's what we're trying to get our kids to do, right? Like just to take that step and to perform that etude at region or to perform that scale playoff in front of their peers for a chair test or to perform that passage of the music before a major, uh, you know, pops festival or concert festival. So um, that that that's what it was for me, that people really want to know and they want to learn and they're willing to learn from us. So that that's for me. Ditto. I, I can't. I can't state that enough. I we're still we're still humbled at at the reception that we're getting, and I think a lot of that had to do um, with our fear, our hesitance, our yeah. not knowing how well it was going to be received, um, yeah. and and that doubt that we carried. Uh, but it it's been it's been humbling to just know it's like, hey man, like we we presented earlier there's space at the table for everybody and yeah, yeah. whether you think you know whether you think it's a table or not it's man it, come in this room let's let's go let's exactly. let's have at it uh and so I, I think that's the biggest thing that we've learned from this is the fact that uh, podcast is another way to reach uh you know i'm doing it as an academic as a, a presenting creative scholarship in a way that's tangible and accessible to all instead of having to pay for a subscription to a scholarly journal. This is a way to reach information and make it more digestible and tangible and immediate for our teachers to use in their classrooms. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That was a good one. Um, I think y'all touched on this a little bit in your presentation, but um, maybe you could just quick, quick go through them. Um, um, what business tools do you pay for to help you manage your podcast? So I think uh, Buzzsprout is pretty much the only monthly fee we have right now. Uh, and I believe we're paying for the $18 a month. Uh, other than that, everything else has come out of pocket. So, um, you know, we front loaded purchasing all the, the microphones. Uh, we have not released merch yet. Uh, some merchandise, Justin and I have two shirts, two hoodies, and our spouses have shirts and hoodies. So uh, that's that's to the extent of what we've done. Everything that you see, it, we do it ourselves. We use Canva. We we put in the work ourselves. So it, there's very little uh, um, cost that, that goes into that, but it also prohibits. And because if we had more financial availability, we could extend our reach. Uh, so business structure right now is paying that monthly service on buzzsprout.com. I agree. Um, how do you choose your guests? That's also an, an organic process. Um, yeah. we, we are intentional about providing a space and a platform for marginalized voices and or content areas uh, or even ideas or topics. Um, something that we have coming up soon is on Hip Hop Music Ed. Um, we, you know, we want to make sure that we try to get from the elementary all the way to the collegiate level. Um, we wanted to present a platform that allows us um, pretty much to present and see and hear what you don't usually see and hear in our profession. Uh, yeah. and, and that's that's kind of the, the main goal. But other than that, we have people that reach out to us that say, hey, I want to be on the podcast. Would you would you consider us? And we've said yes. Um, mm -hmm. So that's it's very organic in that way. Uh, and we've reached out to several people as well that Justin and I recognize their work. And we're like, hey, man, this stuff is cool. Let's just see if they'd be down to, to be on the podcast. And so we have several guests lined up, but it's very organic in the way we do it. Um, and we have about two minutes left, so I think this one is a good one to end on. Um, but do you have any words of wisdom for undergrad music ed students? Man, Ooh. man, you trying to keep us on for a long time. Huh? Uh, <laughs> so my advice would be this, that you would clearly um, 
create a vision of what you want to do and who you want to be for your students in your community. And I say that because I think sometimes music uh, schools have now turned into what I call the Henry T. Ford model, right? They're trying to produce uh, the same T model car to go out um, as though every context community is the same terrain. And I think we hinder our students and we actually hinder the uniqueness of who you are in that program because you're spending four, four and a half years trying to attain this utopian image of a director and you're throwing away the very things that kids need to connect mm. to be better students, right? Um, it's not mm -hmm. just this idea that we want to create, man, I, I know you want to create that monster band program or that choral program or that orchestra program. And I'm with you. I want you to do it. And I'm, and I, and I believe you will, but what I'm saying is in creating that program, it's you, right? When I was at Heights, when me and Eric were at Heights, what we built was literally who we were as people, right? Yeah. This whole montage of us melding two worlds of the, the core discipline and the entertainment and pageantry of the HBCU show style and the allegiance to musical excellence. That's just who we were as people. And I don't think, have we not had clear visions of that through our professors, through the school we went through, or went to, um, I don't know if we would have been able to accomplish that. So I would advise all of you have a clear vision, like sit down. If that means writing down how many kids you want in your band, what type of leadership you want to build, what kind of stand tunes you play. I mean, I know that seems very juvenile and, and very like low hanging fruit, but it's that. How do you plan to insert who you are, the nuances of who you are? I love basketball. I'm a big, you know, I love all styles of music. I'm in church. You know, I'm heavily involved in my faith. How did that impact me as an educator? Um, and I don't want you to put that on the back burner because you you those kids are coming in to meet a person. They're not just coming in to meet this person who waves a baton or teaches them how to, you know, play their horn correctly. So that, write that vision and know what you want to bring and how do you want to impact those kids, man. That's what it's all about for me. I wish we could have cued the Hammond organ behind Justin on that one because, <laughs> uh, but I will, I'll be brief. Be who you needed when you were younger. I don't know, it's a bit cliche, that's but good. it's true. I mean, uh, I, w I was that kid that was overly critical of all the curriculum that would be presented to me in, in yeah. all content areas. Uh, I was that kid in U.S. history asking, where's the Latino American history? Why is it only mentioned Cesar Chavez and Lulac? Mm -hmm. um, I was that kid. And so I went and given I'm reaching what would be considered the highest pinnacle of the education attainment. I'm, I'm seeking a doctorate. And even then I'm being critical of the curriculum. So in return, when I become that person that has the ability to shape the curriculum, to impact the student that I, to, to be that teacher that I needed when I was younger, I have that ability to reflect that and, and, and through my lived experiences. Yeah. Well, those were the perfect answers to end this on. Um, Eric and Justin, thank you so much. I, I know I say thank you so much to y'all, but seriously, this presentation was everything that I think our educators needed right now, our nonprofit partners. Um, I'm, I'm just really grateful for both of y'all's time. Um, if you all have not listened to the score yet, um, definitely get on it because they are two folks that you do not want to miss. Um, so again, thank you so much. And if you all have any questions afterwards, this this is being recorded and we will be able to share it out. Thanks y'all so much. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you and thank everyone.